Welcome to Moving the Needle on Wicked Problems, the podcast that I host with my colleague Paul Fawcett. Today, we are going to discuss a very thorny and timely uh, and complex issue in Canada, which is the state of our federation. At this moment, I have to admit, it feels somewhat fragile. The constant battles on jurisdiction, who has authority to do what, are a constant in our political narrative, whether it is energy or climate, healthcare or fire, firearms. In addition, we've had a more frequent use of the notwithstanding clause by provinces. And all of this leads many to ask the question, do we have a unity problem in Canada? Yeah, that's the big question, Senator. Uh, you know, we often think of the unity question centered around Quebec, uh, but that's not really the case anymore. Out West, it's no longer that the West wants in, but in some people's minds, it's the West wants out. You know, we've seen provinces and leaders that have taken the slogan of American first used by former President Trump and adopted it to their own province. The big question is, where do we go from here and how do we solve these tensions? We have a great guest that can help us with that. Now let's get to the interview. To delve into the complexity and the contours of this issue, we are speaking with my colleague, Senator Paula Simons, who is an independent senator from Alberta, outspoken, independent, uh, cutting edge. Uh, really, I cannot think of anyone better to give us her frank views on, on all of these <laughs> questions. So thank you so much, Paula, for joining us today. I'm very thrilled to be here. We like to give our, our listeners a bit of a, a, a get to know you. So uh, in order to do that, Senator, you're a very well-known journalist, especially in Alberta. Uh, let's take us back to your youth or childhood. What prompted you to become a journalist? And and having been a journalist, how does it how does it help you be an independent legislator? Well, that's a really good question. I mean, I I'm a born and raised Albertan. Um, I grew up immersed in the stories and the politics of this place. But I never intended to be a journalist. My plan was always to go to law school. My father was a lawyer. My father's twin brother was a lawyer. And everybody just assumed because I was talkative and outspoken and argumentative that I too would be a lawyer. And in my first year of university, I had a wonderful English professor named Greg Hollingshead, who would later go on to win the Governor General's Award for Literature. And he was very handsome and I had a bit of a crush on him, I'll confess. And he kept me after class one day and he said, you know, Miss Simons, what, what do you intend to do with your life? And I said, well, I'm going to go to law school. And he was like, no, no, you are a writer and you must write. And so it's all his fault. I, I, I've, I've told him this, um, that I, I gave up law school in the dreams of becoming a writer, realized that I didn't have nearly the creativity or, you know, the, the transcendent capacity to write fiction and fell in love with journalism while doing volunteer work as a university student. And so I went off to take a master's degree The reporter required. There we go. Yeah. So I went off to take a master's degree in journalism at Stanford University, not even entirely being certain that that was what I wanted to do. But as soon as I started working on my first stories, I realized that that this was just as much fun as it was in the TV movies that I got to, you know, uh, investigate murders and buttonhole politicians <laughs> and, and, uh, and and have a lot of I have a lot of fun telling the stories of the place that I loved. So, and I, I grew up in a family that encouraged argumentation. Um, my my parents were both very passionate people who argued a lot about, you know, about politics and culture and and history. And so it was a it was a an environment that encouraged uh, argument and dissent. I guess. Would you say the same about the Senate? I would. I mean, I, it's been interesting to me how transferable many of my skills are. I mean, I spent 
30 years as a journalist asking tough questions of politicians and civil servants and experts. And that's what we do in our committee work. I mean, it is it is directly transferable. I write all my own Senate speeches, and I suppose it won't surprise you to know that I was a very avid member of my high school and university debate club. And so, you know, we did model parliaments and it was it was a lot of fun the first time I got to stand up and, and give a speech in the Senate and think that, you know, I did this when I was playing Let's Pretend as a teenager and now I'm doing it for real. So I think I think I would have been very ill suited to party politics. I'm not very good at following a party line and lining up loyally behind a leader. I think our new independent Senate is ideally suited to my capacity to uh, to make trouble and ask tough questions and uh, sometimes you know sometimes appall people who thought I was their ally and uh, you know just generally to communicate about the work of the reform senate. I think uh, if I may say so as your colleague uh, you keep us on our toes and we cannot put you in a box and that's a good thing but let's stay with journalism. You know, you being a journalist and me being a consumer of journalism, I think we all know that journalism is under threat in many ways. So uh, Elon Musk has said, in fact, that journalism, journalists are the problem oh, because yeah. you think you're the only source of legitimate information. And that's a big lie. I'm, I'm, I'm. I'm not sure how a journalist would respond to this point of view. And I wonder whether you think Canadian journalism has been impacted uh, by this version of the truth. Well, I mean, Canadian journalism, especially outside of Toronto and Montreal, Toronto and Montreal are are especially blessed to have robust newspapers, daily newspapers and daily newspaper economies. In the rest of the country, even in large cities like Edmonton and Calgary and Vancouver, the daily newspaper has been hollowed out. I mean, when we say it's under threat, that doesn't that does not begin to encompass the catastrophe that has already befallen local daily news. When I started working at the Edmonton Journal in 1995, there were literally hundreds of reporters covering the news and now there are about a dozen so it is difficult for me to speak without starting to you know to tear up and get emotional about the destruction of regional daily newspapers in this country and what they offered to people as an authoritative and trusted source of information as a place for community debate as a place for important community conversation i remember in the glory days of the edmonton journal in the late 1990s and the early 2000s when our letters page was a place people came to to understand the co you know the debate of the community where people engaged passionately but respectfully and when the new digital disruption happened, I was an early adopter of social media and I was so excited about the potential for digital communication to reach as many people, to democratize knowledge, to make sure that you weren't just, you know, you didn't have to be a press baron to own the ink to tell the stories. And I thought it would be marvelous if everybody were on Twitter and Facebook and blogging and sharing their perspectives and we would hear fresh voices that had never been heard before. We would hear from the marginalized. And for a while, that idealism was rewarded. I mean, I was such an early adopter of Twitter that I won a, an international prize for being the best user of social media um, because I was doing what everybody just does now. Um, and so I think people thought that this sort of information anarchy would be marvelous. The problem was that that happy state of anarchy could not last. And when Donald Trump sought the nomination for the Republicans in the United States, we saw the weaponization of Twitter and Facebook in ways that we had naively not thought possible for. I mean, it was it was Donald Trump's campaign and it was the Brexit campaign in England that saw international actors, uh, particularly from Russia, but from other places as well, using Twitter and Facebook to set up fake accounts so that you weren't just dealing with trolls, you were dealing with imaginary trolls, with bot farms, with people who were torquing and twisting and 
def- you know, I don't want to say defiling, but debasing the debate that was happening on Facebook and Twitter for their own ends, which were not just ideological, but oftentimes economic. And so the whole sort of peaceable kingdom that we imagined would happen on social media shattered. So now we see, I mean, as we're talking uh, in the week that we're recording this, Facebook has just announced that it's laying off 11,000 people. Twitter, um, Elon Musk is erratically making, you know, decision after decision. People are quitting. People are being laid off. These platforms seem to be going up in flames before our eyes. These platforms that were part of this extraordinary revolution that happened in 2008, 2009, 2010. And the rest of us are going to be left picking up the pieces. But meantime, the newspapers have been decimated. They've lost their readership. They've lost their advertisers. Uh, You know, the the government can try to patch together whatever bailout plans and band-aids they can. But people have lost the habit of daily newspaper reading. And they've lost the habit of watching the 6 o'clock or the 10 o'clock news. And without a trusted source of information, We have allowed the information space to be overwhelmed with disinformation, misinformation, misunderstanding. Uh, So some of that is coming from, you know, cold-blooded bad actors, and some of it is coming from people who are sharing rumor and innuendo and conspiracy and fear-mongering because they honestly believe it to be true. So I, I, I differentiate between people who are doing this very deliberately to achieve a political or an economic end, and people who have been caught up in the cycle of hysteria, who are sharing the same lies over and over and over again, as though the volume of them will somehow make them true. And they truly believe in some of these lies. This is the challenge, you know, yeah. you're, you're at times you're talking to a true believer, And it's really hard to argue against them. We talked about Twitter. You talked about Twitter. You're a Twitter star. You know, you got an award. I I was. Oh, I've I've, I've won a bunch of awards for my innovative and, you know, groundbreaking use of Twitter. I I mean, I spent, I mean, I joined in in early 2009. I have, you know, 65,000 plus followers. I I, I think we we looked it up today. I've I've made something like 77,000 tweets. Um, and now I think, you know, I could I could have written a book. I could, <laughs> could have put some of that creative and intellectual energy into something a little less ephemeral. And I'm going, you know, you're speaking to me while I'm in a mourning period, you know, anger, denial, bargaining, whatever, whatever, you know, depression. I think I'm in the depression phase now as I look at not my life's work, but, you know, 12 years of my life going up in flames, uh, hmm. this platform in which I had invested so much of, of my passion okay. of, you know, it's it's just poofing. Well, I, I follow you on Twitter and you are a substantive, informative, but you're also funny. I, I, I like that. You, your personality shines through. Um, but you've now joined Mastodon. I have. Is that part of the new wave or the Paula Simon's risk mitigation strategy that, or it, it, it's it's the risk mitigation perhaps strategy. Stra- you know, I mean, okay. it's possible. I mean, it's possible that, you know, that that cooler heads will prevail at Twitter and Facebook and maybe things come back from the brink. But I just figured, you know, it's it's my equivalent of having a Swiss bank account since I have no money. <laughs> um, I, I, I'm investing some of my personal capital in Mastodon. We'll see how it works. I mean, my my daughter, who who figures that her whole childhood was blighted by my, my obsession with Twitter, said to me, like, you, you, you know, you're just switching from one, one thing to another. Maybe you could go, if not write a book, you could go read a book. But you're right, Ratna. I mean, I really flattered myself that on Twitter, not only was I providing breaking news and cogent analysis, but that I was funny. I mean, uh, you know, I, I'm I'm really, you know, in, in my fantasy world, I'm a stand-up comedian, and I really tried to use Twitter to be entertaining, to be provocative. You know, I loved it when I, you know, when I I had a, a funny quip or a funny meme that got fire and got thousands and thousands of of likes and retweets. But now I sort of, I, I'm pulling back in this sort of this cold light of day and thinking how much toxic narcissism I have invested in a platform uh, that where, you know, where the creative content never belonged to me. 
I gave I gave away some of my best work and some of my okay. best lines on a capitalist platform that was not really, <laughs> uh, you know, sure, I burnished my brand, but um, I, I'm feeling a little I'm feeling a little foolish at the moment. Oh, I, mean, I, I think. I, ahead, I, I, I was just going to say, I personally really enjoyed actually when you first came into the Senate and you were live tweeting the, the Senate proceedings. Yeah. Uh, for an institution that doesn't get a lot of uh, coverage uh, by the media or otherwise, you know, I thought that was actually quite good. I know you don't do it anymore. I think there was a backlash, well, I, if I remember correctly. No, no about I mean, I, 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 I do it, but only when the debate is sufficiently interesting. I mean, the first time was I was brand new to the Senate and we had, you'll remember, the emergency legislation to send the mm -hmm. postal workers back to work just before Christmas. Yes. They were on rotating strikes. And... I was brand new to the Senate and I was so overwhelmed by how clever the people in the Senate were. Now, I covered a lot of political debates in the Alberta legislature and in Edmonton City Council. I'd never seen anything like the caliber of debate that we were having about that back to work legislation because we had in our chamber, uh, you know, former federal judges, former provincial cabinet ministers, former, uh, you know, labor lawyers and constitutional lawyers. And the caliber of debate was extraordinary. And at that point, the Senate wasn't televised. And because it was an emergency debate on the weekend, there was really no one covering it. And I thought, well, nature abhors a vacuum. There's no journalism covering this event. People can't watch it online. I'll live tweet it. Uh, and and I did, and people in Ottawa were quite taken aback. Everybody in Alberta was like, oh, well, that's Paula. That's what she does. Um, the Ottawa press corps, I think, was a bit horrified that I was on their patch. So I, I did that, and I waited. Frankly, I waited for the speaker or someone to tell me I was out of order. I waited for some senator to you know rise on a, uh, on a point of order or point of privilege, and no one ever did. So I, I did it. I've done it for the maid debate, and I did it. I did it very zealously and and as objectively as I could during the debate on whether to invoke the Emergencies Act to deal with the Ottawa convoy. But honestly, most of what goes on in the Senate is not sufficiently gripping for my Twitter <laughs> audience. So I, I, I tweet I tweet the you know the the really newsy stuff. Now um, I just wanted to ask you because it, it sort of falls along this, you know, the internet and sort of a way forward. And and you've been very invested in Bill C11. Um, you know, there's been lots of ink spilled on that, lots of discussion on social media about that. There seems to be also a difference of opinion to a certain degree on, you know, if you are a, a Canadian actor, part of CanCon, all that sort of stuff that are very supportive. And then there's others that you know find it very problematic so i just wanted to get from your sense of going through all of the committee hearings so much testimony you know do you really believe that c11 is an assault on free speech or is it something that can be workable for for canadian con creators and content uh, people one of the challenges with c11 is that we're really having two debates at the same time there is the imaginary debate about all the things that people imagine that the bill says, that they imagine that it's some kind of, you know, World Economic Forum plot or a censorship bill or an attack on free speech. It is none of those things. It just isn't. It doesn't allow the government to take down your tweets. It doesn't allow the government to censor your political views. It doesn't even really allow the government to control what you see on television or YouTube. But that does not mean I am a big fan of the bill. I think it's poorly drafted. And mm -hmm. I think that some of its critics, especially the digital first creators, have a fair point when they say that the efforts to you know, play with the algorithms to showcase Canadian producers could actually end up backfiring and, and leaving them sort of trapped in a CanCon ghetto. I think and I hope there are ways that we can amend this bill to make it do what the government thinks it's trying to do. I mean, you know, I take the government at its word that it's attempting to support Canadian artists and Canadian culture. I think the way they've drafted the bill is going to be counterproductive. I also think that it's really difficult to impose a 1970s broadcast paradigm on international over-the-top streaming services, whether we're talking about Netflix or Spotify or Disney or Prime or mm -hmm. you know, the new generation of YouTube. So, you know, part of this is a generational divide, um, you know, where I think senators who sort of came of age politically during the golden age of CanCon have a little more, you know, 
faith or belief in this system. Maybe because I'm from the West and from Alberta, maybe because I studied communication theory and journalism at Stanford University in the United States, I think I have a more, oh, I hesitate to use the word libertarian, which has been so debased, but I think I have, I think I have a different perspective than people from central Canada. And I think maybe I'm not that much younger than my colleagues on the committee, but I think maybe just generationally, because I was such an early adopter of social media, mm -hmm. I think even though I'm 58, I think my brain likes to pretend that it's 38. <laughs> so, I mean, one of the things that we wanted to do and and uh, and we'll shift gears a little bit to to our sort of primary focus, uh, that we talked about. And you actually sort of just talked about it right there about different perspectives in Canada. You mentioned that you're from the West, you're from Alberta, you have a maybe a different perspective than people that grew up in Ontario or other parts of the, the country. You know, I think Canada has always had jurisdictional fights. They've always had tensions between different parts of the country. Uh, maybe it's because of social media. Maybe it's because more people have, you know, the ability to to make comments. But do you think we have a unity problem in Canada? Well, I mean, I think we have a perpetual unity problem in Canada, which goes back to, you know, pre-1867. It's the whole reason we have the Senate, which was set up in part to be a sop to New Brunswick and Nova Scotia so that they would enter Confederation, knowing that between the two of them, they'd get as many senators as Ontario and Quebec. So, I mean, Western Canada has a long and glorious history of feeling aggrieved. It dates well before social media. Uh, it dates back you know, to the days before the telegram um, because we were treated like a colony by central Canada. And I know that sounds a bit rich because of course we were a colony, ask all the indigenous people of this area, ask the Métis Nation. But you know, beginning with the Riel Rebellion, I think there was a real feeling that the West got treated like a colonial satellite of the rest of Canada. Um, you know, Alberta was not part of Canada at Confederation. I don't just mean it wasn't a province. I mean, this was Rupert's land. And it was, although the British controlled the trade, I mean, it was Indigenous territory until the signing of the treaties. So we have a very different history than the rest of Canada. And from the moment that we became part of Canada, even before we were a province called Alberta, I think there was a, a feeling that we got the short end of the stick in terms of, you know, the way rail contracts treated us, the way uh, you know people paid attention to our issues. And just the further you are from the center, the more likely I think you are to feel overlooked and snubbed. And uh, you know, once we entered Confederation in 1905, we were still treated like a second-class province. We didn't get control over our natural resources, which other provinces had always had. So, you know, we were fighting for respect and attention from Ottawa. And this is a thing that transcends, uh, you, know, it, you know, whether the government here was liberal or conservative or United Farmers of Alberta, which was like a, a precursor to the CCF, or whether it was social credit uh, or whether it was the New Democrats under Rachel Notley. We have a long, long, long history of, of feuding with Ottawa for what we think of as our fair share. I think that when I first joined the Senate in 2018, 2018, 2019, when the Senate was dealing with bills like uh, C-69 and C-48, which were going to be, which were perceived as being extremely disadvantageous to Alberta and the energy sector, at, a, at the same time that oil prices were crashing and people here were undergoing incredible economic dislocation, there was a lot of legitimate anger in Alberta. And, you know, I had to fight hard when I became a senator, A, to try and explain Alberta to my Senate colleagues, but also B, to try to, you know, to try to speak to Albertans to say, look, independence is a losing game for us. We are a landlocked exporting jurisdiction. We export oil. We export natural gas. We export canola. We export beef. I mean, we if we can't get access to the port of Vancouver and the port of Prince Rupert, um, I mean, we you know we're four million landlocked people. We cannot be an independent country. What we need to do is take a leadership role in Confederation and start arguing, you know, passionately and sincerely for, you know, the best possible deal for Alberta and for understanding for Alberta. 
And, you know, I have to say, when Rachel Notley was premier, she fought as hard for Alberta as Ralph Klein or Peter Lougheed had ever done. And it was in no small part because of her leadership uh, that Alberta got the TMX pipeline deal. Uh, you know, Ottawa stepped up when when private capital was leaving that project to say that Ottawa would put its federal financing behind TMX. That's incredibly important to Alberta's energy sector. So, you know, I think what I've learned about being in the Senate is that every single region in Canada thinks it's getting a raw deal. I mean, if you talk to my Senate colleagues from Newfoundland or Prince Edward Island or, you know, Yukon, they all say the same thing. And frankly, if you talk to senators from outside the GTA, they think they're getting a raw deal okay. in, you know, in, in northern Ontario. And if you talk to people from the GTA, they think they're getting a raw deal because Toronto is underrepresented um, yep. in the House of Commons. So, you know, we are a country connected by a vast sense of grievance. I mean, Festivus ought to be our national holiday where we would all just have the airing of grievances. Uh, so I think what Albertans need to understand is, yes, historically, we have been disadvantaged and so have other regions in the country. And pointing fingers, it's like that. Well, Paul will know what I mean, even if Ratna doesn't. It's like that Spider-Man meme where everybody points at everybody else and says it's your mm -hmm. fault. If we're going to grow up as a country, we have to stop this regional parochialism. We have to stop nurturing our profound sense of injustice. I mean, we're all behaving like a bunch of, you know, of 13 year olds who all believe the world is against us. We need to get out of our adolescence and come together as one country, large landmass, small population. If we want to make our mark in the world, we cannot be engaging in these internecine internal regional battles. It's just stupid. Do you think actually, though, in saying all that, that there is a real threat? Like, is there, you know, often when we think of separation, it's 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 focused on Quebec. That's the more traditional sort of thing. It's it's new in Alberta to be, at least I think, in the sense well, of, and no, you sort I of mean, highlighted it. Is it a real threat, or is it just, as you said, positioning to get the best deal? You know, when I was a journalist starting off my career in the late 1980s, the Western Canada concept was Alberta's first separatist party, and it actually elected an MLA to the Legislative Assembly in Alberta. I mean, so Western separatism is not new. The Western Canada concept actually had a better idea. I mean, they were racists and anti-Semites, so they were not good people, but at least they had an intelligent plan that involved BC, Alberta, Washington State, uh, you know, Idaho and Montana all separating into a country called Cascadia. And we were going to let Saskatchewan come if they were nice. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it was still a dumb idea, but it was a less dumb idea than being, you know, a landlocked country of four million people. I actually think, ironically, that a lot of the air has gone out of that balloon. I think that COVID, perversely, as terrible as COVID has been to lots of the political discourse in this country and in this world, I think Albertans actually saw how useful it was to be part of a confederation when we needed Ottawa to step in and send us emergency aid, when other Canadians reached out to support us. And if I, I know that, you know, it may not look like it from the outside, but most Albertans, I saw poll numbers that were just released, um, you know, today, I'm speaking to you on November 10th, um, that showed that support in Alberta for things like an independent pension plan and Alberta police force has actually gone down markedly. So I actually think that the Wexit energy was much greater in 2018 when oil prices were crashing. Now that oil prices are back up um, and now that we have, uh, you know, I mean, uh, we're having a lot of political turmoil in the provincial leadership in this province is a lot of division internally, but, you know, arguing for sovereignty, I don't think is selling here as well as it might have done three years ago. So, Paula, you invoked Peter Lougheed's name, and of course, that takes us to the notwithstanding clause, which he was the main, along with Alan Blakeney, you know, those two fought, fought hard to insert it into uh, into our uh, constitution. And as we well know, it overrides charter protections and has been used more frequently in, in recent times, you know, not just uh, Bill 21 in Quebec, but also last week, the premier of my province, Doug Ford, uh, invoked it in order to uh, prevent uh, uh, workers from striking. 
which is a clear infringement of the rights of people, whether they are minorities or not. Or, or not. So is this an inkling into the aggressiveness of provincial premiers to exercise more authority? I mean, we've seen some of that in the latest discussions on the health accord where everybody's walked away with with, you know, high highfalutin statements, but really no action for the people who are sick. And I wonder if this is working at all. Um, and and are we able to find a way out of this, notwithstanding and other bickering that we seem to be engaging in? All right. So these are these are two questions, and I'm going to take them separately. The notwithstanding clause is an interesting history in Alberta because, yes, it was championed by Peter Lougheed and it was really originally the brainchild of Lougheed's Justice Minister Merv Leach. And the idea was to make sure that the supremacy of Parliament would not be, you know, completely trumped by the courts. And that was the, the bargaining chip that got Alberta and Saskatchewan to, to be part of the Constitutional Accord in 1982. The notwithstanding clause was first invoked in Alberta in 1998 by Premier Ralph Klein in a case it was in the aftermath of a case involving a woman named Leilani Muir. Leilani Muir had been the victim of a fourth sexual sterilization uh, under Alberta's uh, appalling sexual sterilization act. Uh, and she sued the province and won a significant damage claim. And in the wake of her victory, the province got worried about all the other people who might sue them because they had also been victims of forced sexual sterilization. And so they preemptively invoked the notwithstanding clause to make it impossible for those people to sue. The outrage was instantaneous and enormous. And I have to say that the Edmonton Journal, where I worked at the time, was sort of in the vanguard of leading the backlash. And the government backed down almost immediately. And Ralph Klein gave a very sheepish apology and said, you know, he was very sorry that he had done this. <laughs> And just a couple of months later, the Supreme Court made its decision in the Vreend case, which established uh, uh, constitutional protection for people on the basis of sexual orientation. And Ralph Klein came under tremendous pressure from his own conservative caucus to invoke the notwithstanding clause to prevent uh, LGBTQT Albertans from having equal rights. And I think it was a case of once burned, twice shy. He remembered what had happened in the wake of the Leilani Muir invocation and he refused, despite incredible pressure from right-wing forces within his own cabinet, who were really hounding him to invoke the notwithstanding clause, and he didn't do it. And what this teaches us is that if there is enough political backlash, a smart politician will back away. And that's what we saw in Ontario, right? Doug Ford invoked the notwithstanding clause. There was a tremendous um, outcry, and he backed away very, very quickly. So to me, that's the clause working the way it's supposed to. The problem we have is when we get to Quebec. Yeah. And Quebec, I mean, Bill 21 is not the first time the province of Quebec has invoked the notwithstanding clause. The problem is if the people of the province don't stand up and say this is unjust, if in fact the people of the province are quite happy to go along with this majoritarian tyranny, because they are the majority and it is majoritarian tyranny, then you don't have the healthy democratic debate that you had in Alberta in 1998 and that you had in Ontario this month to, to say, wait a minute, there's a there's a huge political cost to invoke the notwithstanding clause. As long as we as voters insist on the economic, you know, sorry, pardon me, not the economic peril, the political peril of invoking the notwithstanding clause, then we have equilibrium and then we're fine. But Quebec is the obvious example of the case where if people don't stand up and say this is outrageous, then what then what do we do? So I, you know, you and I have talked at length about Bill 21. Uh, you know, and because of my Jewish family roots, I I find Bill 21 particularly offensive. Uh, but we have created for Quebec this special status and we don't hold them to the same standards that we hold other provinces. I mean, if Alberta did something as overtly racist as Bill 21, everybody would scream, oh, Alberta, this terrible redneck province. But when Quebec does it, somehow we give this, this fig leaf of feminism and say that it's fine. Uh, so, you know, th there is a double standard, but I don't think 
I think based on Doug Ford's experiences, I don't think politicians are going to be willy nilly invoking the notwithstanding clause. I don't think they will. Yeah. Uh, because as long as we keep the political ho- costs high enough, then then they then they don't. Now, to your other question, I mean, my entire career as a journalist, health ministers have been going to conferences and demanding more money from the province. Yeah. This is nothing new. The, what is new is that our hospitals are in a uniquely crisis position brought on by uh, by COVID and the failure, frankly, of almost every province to take proper mitigation measures against COVID, the relaxation of all the COVID restrictions. I mean, I could point to my own province, but frankly, there's no province that's any better at this point. Um, I mean, how many children have to be sick in emergency rooms? How many, you know, how many pediatric wards have to be filled to overflowing before we say, hmm, you know, maybe the mask mandate was doing something? Uh, you know, I don't know. But, you know, I would, if I were the federal government, I wouldn't necessarily be taking out my checkbook and giving provinces huge swacks of money without strings attached. Because the problem is, you know, where, where is the, where are the evidences that the provinces are actually going to use the money to deal with the pinch points in the healthcare system? So, you know, to me, to me, there's, you know, I don't want to say there's nothing new under the sun that makes me sound very ancient, but uh, to see provinces annoyed that they don't have as much healthcare money as they want um, is is as perennial as the Canada Health Act. As they run surpluses as well. Yeah, That's, you know, yeah. I, I mean, think there's there's real anger in in my province at the checks we got at the budget surplus that the Ontario government has posted and at the ongoing crisis in our hospitals. I believe it is the people who will turn on all governments and demand some action. But let's move on to, you know, a slightly more optimistic question about immigration. I think immigration is is an is a file of optimism. It's what people, their hopes and dreams and their aspirations. And our government has taken a pretty interesting step of announcing unprecedented levels in the immigration uh, numbers over the next three years with 500,000 coming in in three years. Alberta, what does this mean for Alberta and what does it mean for Alberta's smaller communities? I think this is potentially great news for Alberta. Uh, You know, Alberta, I think what is sometimes frustrating to me is when I see people come and they go to, you know, they go to Toronto and Vancouver and then complain that the rents are high. Well, you know, uh, Calgary is a city of one million plus people. Edmonton is a city of one million plus people. And we have lots of other smaller cities here that offer a wonderful quality of life and affordable affordable housing and great economic opportunity. Alberta has to be more aggressive about recruiting immigrants to come here. I mean, various provinces, various governments over the years have been so, but it's sort of, there have been ebbs and flows. I think Alberta must do more to recruit the best and the brightest to come here. We need labor. We always need labor in this province. And I don't just mean people to do, you know, uh, to do the frontline work. We need intellectual, uh, you know, talent. For our, for our growing AI industry, for our growing nanotechnology sector, for our growing um, uh, pharmaceutical industries, for our growing, you know, uh, I, I was uh, moderating an event at the University of Alberta uh, this week where we were talking about cellular agriculture built, you know, growing, growing beef and uh, dairy and mm-hmm. egg proteins from cells. You know, we... We desperately need the best and the brightest from around the world, the hardest working, the people who are willing to to take a chance and come here. And frankly, post COVID, as we've learned that people don't all have to be congregated in the same offices. We have smaller communities in this province uh, that are practically ghost towns. We could fill them back up. You know, you could come Come to Alberta, my friends, buy a house for $65,000 in a smaller city, uh, vote for the party that you like, and then we change Alberta uh, in every sense. But, y- you know, I mean, this is a province built on immigration. My father's family came to this province more than 100 years ago as immigrants and economic refugees uh, fleeing persecution of Jews in the Russian Pale. Uh, my mother came to this country as a refugee after the Second World War uh, as a child brought by my grandmother, who was a widow with three young children who came here and, and built a very successful life for herself. So I think Albertans, you know, people think 
sometimes that we are a racist province, a province that, you know, but honestly, since the beginning of our history, this has been a province that has welcomed immigrants and newcomers, uh, whether they were black settlers coming to Amber Valley, you know, and they weren't always welcomed, but, but you know, they, they built lives for themselves that were hugely successful in Northern Alberta. Uh, this is a province where Chinese immigration has a history more than a hundred years old where, you know, where, you know, I live in Edmonton, home of Canada's first mosque. This is a, this is a province that has embraced immigration since the beginning, uh, you know, our our begetting sin here has to do with the treatment of indigenous Albertans. Mm -hmm. That's you know that's, uh, that's on the on the report card. That's that's where we're getting the lowest marks. That's where we need to be doing the most work. But I think Albertans have always been open to immigration, and I think this is going to be what we need. I mean, frankly, if we want more clout in Confederation, we need a larger population. You need yeah. Um, Alberta's not doing too badly in my town. When I ride the subway in Toronto, what do I see? Ads from the government of Alberta beckoning us out west, especially younger people. You know, you want a home, you want a life, uh, come to Alberta. And my daughter's friends, some of them are seriously thinking about it. So, you know, the problem is that th this province has to decide to get its act together, though. Like, you know, if, if we have provincial governments whose policies are anathema to bright, young, cosmopolitan tech workers, mm -hmm. then they're not going to come here. You know, if if you project an image, which is a false image, that everybody here um, is some kind of religious zealot or, you know, right wing radical, which is not the Alberta that I know, which is not the city of Edmonton where I live, uh, then we're we're shooting ourselves in the foot. What we need to do is to tell people, hey, this is a city with great restaurants, with great theater, with great symphony, with a fantastic university, with you know a leading health system, uh, with some of the best public schools in North America. If you want people to come here, you have to play up our real strengths and not project this image that you know that like. Like, you know, like we're trying to be the Alabama of Canada. That is not an effective way to grow the economy. You're a terrific ambassador for your province, Senator. My final question. It's always my final question when we're dealing with sticky problems like federation and jurisdiction and infighting. Are you optimistic about the future for Canada? I'm optimistic about the future for Canada. And I think it's because I spend so much time visiting schools. Uh, mm -hmm. You know, whether I'm talking to grades in Alberta, you learn about the, the Constitution and governance in grades 6, 9, and 12. So I speak constantly to kids in grades 6, 9, and 12. I visit university classrooms. And when I see how smart, how multicultural, and how ethically focused young people are today, they are just superior to what I was at their age in almost every sense. They have grown up in a multicultural, pluralist community where they have been keenly aware of social justice issues. They care about the environment in a way that, that you know, I didn't when I was their age. You know, they care about social justice and they care about equity. And that doesn't make them, you know, left of center or right of center. Uh, they are a generation that is genuinely interested, I think, in in taking their power to make this a better place. And so I am optimistic, not necessarily about the old guards and not even necessarily in the short term, but in the medium and long term. Yes, I think that this is a I think my province is a province of great promise. And I think our country is the country of promise for the world. The country of promise for the world. That is a wonderful note to end on. Thank you, Senator Simons. This has been interesting beyond belief. I could have talked to you for another hour, but I don't think you have the time or our audience has the time. Uh, to my listeners, I will say, uh, let us know how you think we're doing. Talk to us over Twitter, even though Twitter is in flux, but still talk to us over Twitter or other means and tell us who you'd like to hear from or what subject. And uh, of course, we always love, love to hear from you. And to my colleague, uh, Senator Simons, it's my privilege to have you sitting next to me in the Senate. Well, it's my, I mean, you have been a mentor and a role model for me since the minute 
I got to the Senate uh, and I, you know, I, I, I'm so grateful. People sometimes ask me, what's the best thing about being a senator? And I always say the best thing about being a senator is that once I was 55, I thought I'd made all my friends. Um, you know, I didn't think I was going to get to make such wonderful new friends. And this is the great, this is the truly great gift about being a senator. It isn't, you know, it isn't the salary. It isn't the pension, although those are nice. Uh, what it is, is that you get to sit in a chamber with some of the most remarkable Canadians, people of, you know, uh, people of intellect, of, of great, uh, you know, business acumen, uh, people who've dedicated their lives to public service, and you get to be privileged to sit amongst truly extraordinary Canadians who are doing their best for the country that they love. And people are so cynical about the Senate so much of the time. I, you know, I wish I could bring all Canada on a field trip to see us when we're at our best, because I think it would change a lot of hearts and minds. Terrific closing, Senator, on a high note. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you, Paul.